I think we can start now. Great, perfect. All right, hello and welcome to our 16th session for LLM courses and our second session for an LLM at Columbia Law School. Today we have Goodney hosting the session. Uh, Goodney is an LLM candidate at Columbia Law School and is also a recipient of the prestigious Fulbright Scholarship. She completed her bachelor's degree in law and her magister juris from the University of Iceland. And before joining Columbia, she was most recently working in the field of competition law in Brussels. Goodney, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for taking your time for the session. Uh, I think you might be on mute, sorry. Yes, I was on mute. Thank you for having me is what I said. <laughs> Great. Uh, and just for everyone's information, the session is also being recorded. It will later be posted on College's website uh, where anyone who misses out on it can go ahead and view it. So great, uh, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and put up the questions on the screen and we can kick off the session. And okay. if anyone has any questions in the middle, please go right ahead and ask. You can unmute yourself, you can put it on the chat box, whatever works. Great. All right, so we'll be looking at a number of topics in this session. Uh, we'll be looking at university and course selection, the application requirements, uh, the personal statement and the Fulbright scholarship. So let's start out with university selection first. Goodney, can you tell us how did you approach the process of shortlisting universities and what were the factors which you had considered while applying to universities? OK, um, for me, it was it was a very new uh, thing for me because not a lot of people I know from Iceland had done an LLM in the United States. But I had the way I uh, started to think that this was something that I wanted to do is because I knew of some Icelandic people who had been to Duke. Uh, okay. And from that, I just started to, I, I spent like a year just going through every single university's homepage and trying to figure out what would be the best program for me. And uh, I knew that I wanted to do corporate law. Uh, and when making this decision, there were a bunch of factors that came into it. For me, I thought, do I want to live on the West Coast or the East Coast? Does that matter? For me, because I live in Iceland, the West East Coast is closer. So I thought to myself, OK, I want to be on the East Coast. That narrows it down to a certain pool. Um, but uh, but what else what it came down to in the end for me why I like my my top choice was Columbia was because I I reached out to as many people as I could and asked them uh, about their experience. I talked to people who had been to NYU. I talked to people who had been in Duke, talked to people who had been in Columbia and in Harvard. And in the end, for me, Columbia was the best combination of academics, location, prestige, uh, quality of program, and yes, and just a really good program in corporate law. So that's why I, that's why that, the, these East Coast uh, schools were my top choices. Great, thank you for that. And apart from Columbia, in your opinion, what are some other programs in corporate law that future applicants can look at? I think the, uh, there's a really good one in Stanford, but again, if you, uh, it depends if you want to be on the West Coast or, or the East Coast. Uh, I also got into Duke and Georgetown and NYU. And uh, I think the program at Duke is really good as well. I have uh, two Icelandic friends who went there. One of them is now working at a law firm in New York City and the other one is in London. What uh, what influenced me to decide to go to Columbia over Duke, even though Duke was offering me a better uh, financial aid or scholarship, was that, I, again, it, there are so many things to take into account when you're making this decision. For me, a part of my decision was I'm, uh, I am 31 now, um, and I thought to myself, if I was younger, then a campus, American campus life would probably be a great fit. But I thought for me, in my life and where I am, I thought New York City would be a better fit. And and I mean, I, and for some reason, I just have a blue heart. I really wanted to go to Columbia. I understand that. All right. So uh, moving on with university selection, we've also received uh, a few crowdsourced questions on this topic. So mm -hmm. I'll just read out the first one. 
Hi, I'm confused between US and Europe for an LLM. What would be better from the perspective of employment considering you studied in Iceland? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's okay. Is it, and this is a person from India who's asking this question, right? We actually don't know. These are all anonymous queries that we've received on a link that we had circulated prior to this. Yeah. Okay. Not that it really matters. But for me, I did a long research into whether I wanted to do Europe or uh, the US. What influenced my decision was that I would already worked in Brussels and Luxembourg in EU law for uh, one and a half a year. So I thought to myself that I wouldn't it wouldn't make sense for me to study more European Union law because I had uh, already had work experience there. But what I would say also influenced my decision is that the the the, the way they teach in uh, England is similar to how they teach in Iceland in a sense that it's more a lecture form and there's one big exam at the end of not even the semester at the end of the school year okay. and 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 what I wanted I because I've done five years of that kind of school so so I thought to myself that the Socratic method that they use in the United States school would be a better fit and improve my skills as a lawyer more because there you're always on call and you have to be, be prepared for every class and it helps you just be more balanced throughout the semester and learn continuously instead of just having this one final exam in the end. But of course it differs what people prefer, what kind of style they like. I of course cannot tell you exactly which uh, which would be a better opportunity for work. But I will say from the people that I know, and this is from my Icelandic perspective, yes. Um, yes. there have been better outcomes uh, in the job market after they went to an LLM in the United States All right. than, in, than in Europe. But that is accepting Oxford and Cambridge. If you get Oxford and Cambridge, I would that's like that's top notch. But other than that, I would say that job opportunities are better after an LLM in, in the US schools. Great, thank you for that answer. That's very informative. Let's move to the next question on this. Uh, the other question that we've received from the, uh, from the attendees. Howard with 25% aid and Columbia with 50%. What would you recommend? Yeah, I can't. I really can't say. It's. Uh, I mean, it depends on so much, of course, your own financial situation and I mean, Harvard is Harvard, and if you are a person that sees yourself thriving there, I mean, it's a it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. But Colombia is also great, and if you got a fifty percent discount from Colombia, that is huge as well. Like, I, they, they, there are not many people that get that good scholarships. So you just have to take everything into account. Are you a city person? Do you prefer being on campus? Are you going into the academics? Then Harvard for sure. Are you going to go to the law firm? Uh, are you going into a, a corporate law firm career? Then probably maybe Columbia. It, so it really depends on what your alt, what your end goal is and what type of person you are. Here in New York, we are very. It's a very outgoing crowd. We're all very social, and I think there's a reason why we all wanted to come to New York because we're this type of person. Um. But but there I mean but we have all all kinds of people but I mean I would say if you're going into academics if that's your goal then I would say Harvard if you're going for corporate law I would say Columbia. Perfect. Uh, we can now come to the final crowdsource question on university selection, which is what are your thoughts on an executive LLM from Columbia? I really don't know anything about that. I'm sorry. I didn't. I always. I. I wanted to do my LLM in person, so I never even looked at the at the 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 the, the distance learning options. So I can't really comment on that. Perfect. So I think that kind of winds up this section. Uh, if anyone has any questions at this point, please feel free to jump in. You can use the chat box, or you can just unmute yourself and ask. OK, so I think we can move on. Oh, OK, yeah, there's someone asking. Yeah, Bharti, you can unmute yourself. Please go ahead. Good evening, ma'am. I'm from Hi. India. Uh, so my query is how, as you said, that for a job or a corporate firm, we 
right? How would you go about that process for applying in Colombia, University of Colombia? So, sorry, can you repeat your question? As you said a few minutes uh, earlier that for job or corporate firm, you can go to Corp University of Colombia, right? Uh -huh. So how can, uh, since I'm from India, how can I approach that university? After I, my graduation. Uh, sorry, just to jump in over here, Bharti, we will be looking at the application requirements just right away. So perhaps uh, your question might be answered at that point. Uh, we can ask Goodney to give a brief summary of the entire application process. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, sure. And if you have any specific questions on that, perhaps you can ask again. No, no, no. If she can brief, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just, I'll just ask. For that. Great. Uh, so, Goodney, coming now to the application requirements. Uh, uh -huh. Before we jump into any specific questions for this, can you give us a brief rundown of how this process works? of applying to T14 schools in the US in general and Colombia in particular. OK, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I would say that uh, one of the most important things is start early. Uh, I was I have been thinking about this for years before I actually did it. And and then my application process started a one and a half year before going in the sense that uh, all the universities have this have this portal called LSEC, Law School Association. But I don't remember what the what it stands for, but it's a website called LSEC.com where you upload all of your uh, all of the required documents. They will they will ask for your transcripts. They want it ranked and they want a personal statement and then they want uh, recommendation letters from three people. But what what uh, what the, the the what's the word? The convenience of it is that you can you use this one portal for all the schools, but of course you will uh, change your personal statement according to which school you're applying to at the time. So the the main the first step for all these U.S. universities is to make an account in the LSEC, and there you can see step by step what you need to provide. But I can give further information on that if it if it doesn't come up here. Perfect. So uh, what we're seeing on the screen right now is a screenshot from the university website. It has a number of requirements, including the personal statement, the resume, uh, the, the, the transcripts that are required. I'd like to speak to you about two of these requirements, the CV and the personal statement. We can look at a couple of questions on those. So firstly, on the personal statement, uh, Goodney, the university website is largely silent on what is required out of the personal statement. Uh, mm -hmm. So can you walk us through the general requirements, the, the length of the personal statement, the structure of it, and what kind of facts should be included in it to kind of demonstrate that you do meet the selection criteria for Columbia? Yeah, so for me, because I'm a Nordic person, we and we are not uh, used to uh, uh, boast about our accomplishments. It was very, it was a weird mindset to get into when I was starting to write my letters for the U, uh, the American universities because it's it's very different styles in Europe and in in the United States. In Europe, you want to be modest. I mean, of course, show all your great qualities, but do in a in a in a modest way. But if you're applying for an American school, you are you should be as flamboyant and amazing as you can possibly appear. So don't be afraid to talk yourself up. I mean, and don't downplay anything because all the other applicants are going to be making a huge deal out of everything they have done up until this point. So yeah, so just keep that mindset in when you're applying for an American school. And I would say another very important part is to <clears throat> write a story. The personal statement, because there these people are reading hundreds and thousands of personal statements. You want to make it a story and you have to make sure like your intro should be in a way that it's like capturing, capturing the, the reader. Like it, it gets them excited. Um, and another very important thing is to make be careful not to do not to uh, repeat everything that uh, that your CV says in your resume because the CV speaks for itself. But what you want to do is create a story around this, uh, the facts, the, the, the facts of your CV. So to, but but be sure not to be just listing like I went to this school, then I did that, then I did that make it a story, make it fun to read and 
another tip I would say is don't be afraid to write in a, a moment of failure in your academic uh, or professional career in the sense that you can start show how you learn from that failure and how you how you proceed per, how you persevered through that failure and how that made you a better lawyer slash student in the end from it so they they love a good comeback story they love drama you know so if so tell them everything that is that could that makes you an interesting person yes and also tell them about how at this time maybe you failed this one test and that made you think to yourself okay now I, I failed this test why did I fail and you felt then that it's so important to you to do well so the next year you did this and this and this you know just make a fun interesting story out of it and don't hold back in telling them how amazing you are great thank you for that uh, and in terms of general guidance uh, in your opinion what are some do's and don'ts for the personal statement uh, don'ts is what I mentioned before to be repeating, like just lining up your CV again in the personal statement. Um, and do's again, I would say, tell them a story of a time where you had trouble and how you conquered that trouble and how that made you the person you are today or the, the student, the academic, the, the professional you are today. Um, and also like what I did, because I've lived abroad a lot, so I put a lot of emphasis on how much I changed from these those experiences. Um, because it is, uh, even though we're coming here to to possibly stay for a longer time, we're always going to be representatives for our country. So if you show that you understand the value of these exchange programs or these moving abroad, programs and and how it hasn't impacted you before and why do you want to come to the united states tell them that do you have some connection either to the school or to the country in general oh uh, yeah i would i would say that perfect uh, all right so i think we can move on to the next section now the other component of the application process which is the cv or the resume so uh, the first query on this is like based on your experience uh, what are the kind of internships and activities uh, and things that applicants can do to kind of develop a strong background for an LLM in corporate law? Yeah, uh, obviously I can only say from my experience as a, a student in Iceland, but I basically I tried to do everything that was possible. I sat on all the committees. I did all the internships available to me, often unpaid and some paid. And I worked and I don't know how the school system works if you have summers off, but I worked during summer and. Uh, and I did and I was fortunate enough to have lived uh, and uh, not just studied, but worked abroad. So of course, but, but just everything you can, like just use every chance you can to learn more is my is my goal. That is my advice, I, I mean. All right, uh, so in terms of just publications, uh, do you know of any specific blogs or journals that students can aim to get published in to develop their profile for an LLM in corporate law? I'm not very. I, I mean, we have here in Colombia, we have all these different journals uh, for, yeah. for law and business, for example, and international law. As I understand it, uh, the students can apply to be a staff member, which would be like helping with editing and citation. I don't yeah. think that the students will actually be publishing their articles in those journals, but there are definitely a lot of opportunities here to get in uh, to be able to work with the journals in whatever way to enhance your uh, probability of having something published. But I'm sure I'm not the best person to ask about this, but I'm sure that there are also journals that students are publishing in. I'm just not that I don't have a very good knowledge of that. That's OK. Yeah, uh, we can move on to some crowdsource questions that we have on this. So mm -hmm. uh, read it out to you. Uh, I'm in the top 25 percent of my class, did a few moves and got a few publications in some journals currently working at a law firm. Do I have a shot at Columbia? I would say, yeah, definitely, especially if you're working with corporate law that I mean, all of these things sound very good. I would definitely uh, encourage you to apply if you're interested in Columbia. And you're only going to get into the schools that you apply for. So, so you should never not apply to a school because you think you're not don't have the credit credentials for it. 
you can only you can all i mean if they don't get in that's fine but always try and those credentials that i'm seeing right there they just sound really good uh great so that kind of ties into a question that i had so mm -hmm. the emphasis on a good class rank uh, by columbia and uh, another way to put this is uh, can can co curricular activities or good work experience can it make up for an average or a bad class rank i yes i for columbia i think they take that into account my okay. experience from the application process and from the people that i've talked to who for example went to harvard um and and stanford kind of as well they were they were top 10% in their class, top, top 10 or 5%. So I feel like at least Harvard has a big emphasis on grades. Okay. Columbia wants, wants good grades as well, but they are, I feel like they look more into the whole package. Like just how you have, what have you, what have you been doing since you became a student and like volunteer work, uh, members of a committee, uh, writing uh, like publishing a, a paper all of this i i would say that columbia does take into account the whole package and they want interesting and driven people to come and it and if and if you're not in the top five percent of your class that is not going to be an automatic no not at all perfect thank you for that answer uh the last question on cv and the resume portion of the application is uh, that in your experience, how much work experience is uh, good for an application to Columbia? Uh, and can applicants even consider applying right out of law school? So um, I remember when I was selecting the schools, Columbia did put an emphasis on having at least a two year work experience. And when I was applying for Columbia, I remember that they asked me the total of months I had worked, but I had worked for a few years, so it was like <clears throat> but it shows me that they are also giving you, uh, they're also giving you, uh, what's the word, like a way to show your work experience, maybe alongside law school, for example, an internship or or whatever. Um, they say that they prefer people who have worked at least two years. I personally wanted to work for two two or three years before doing my LLM, wherever it would end up being, just because uh, you learn specific things in law school and then you go to the the work environment and that is very different and I would say that I'm very glad that I've worked for a few years now and I'm coming back to law school because it gives me such better perspective and I can look at the law in uh, from the practical side as well not just in theories but I will tell you that there are a few people in our LLM batch now that are coming straight out of law school so okay. that is an option so it's, it's always going to depend on what your goals are and how, how how does it fit into your life at this point? I would say you, you benefit from it more if you've had some at least two years two years of work work experience, but it's not going to exclude you if you don't have the exact two years. They look at the whole thing, and like I said, like we have a few students coming straight out of law school. Great, thank you for that. Uh, that brings us to the last section on the Fulbright scholarship. But before mm -hmm. that, can you just uh, briefly tell us about the kind of scholarship opportunities and the financial aid opportunities that are available at Columbia before we dive specifically into the Fulbright scholarship? Yes, <clears throat> um, uh, there are a few uh, scholarships that are like specific specific for uh, certain parts of the uh, of the world. Like there are some. Yeah, I think there's one for. Uh, I think there's one, I don't know if it's specifically for India or Asia in general, but there are, and there's like this human rights uh, scholarship. There was no corporate scholarship uh, that was open to apply for. Um, it was more uh, your country, country specific, if you were a representative of your country. So there were no scholarship that matched, uh, matched for, my, for me to um, apply to but they do give financial aid on, on, on a need base, which means that they will take into consideration if you can show them that you can't really afford the whole tuition of $80,000, which is a lot. They, they, are, they do help you. A lot of people got from 10,000 to 20,000, and I've heard about 30,000. 
and they will even offer you a loan. Like you can get a $20,000 deduction and then a $20,000 loan from the school. So, so if they want to take you in as a candidate, they, they will, they, there are ways for them to help you financially. So, and from what I understand, they were like, they, I think they're fair in their assessment of that. But what I also know is that there are some scholarships that are paid afterwards. Uh, if you if you have a certain uh, average grade at the end of the year, you can uh, you can qualify for some scholarships that are like afterwards paid. So yeah, but the but for the for Columbia, there are these specific scholarships for specific fields and for people from specific countries. So look into that, and they they do offer financial aid. I mean, not to everyone. You have to show them that you need, really need it, but they at least they can give you the loan if you can't get a loan from your from your government student fund or whatever. They 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 do help you. Great. Uh, so let's now move to the Fulbright scholarship. Can you mm -hmm. tell us about the eligibility criteria for this? Yes. So again, again with the Fulbright, start early. Uh, don't. Don't start writing your personal statement like a week before the, the deadline. Start thinking about it months and at months ahead. But the, that what they say is obviously they want. Ac good academics, they want. There's no specific requirement of work experience or you have to have a, this high of a grade. It's not like that. What what my experience was going through the Fulbright uh, application process is that they are very much looking for a person to represent the that country in the United States. So they want to find obviously they're going to they want you to be a good scholar for sure, but they also want you to be the type of person who will be a good connect contact between that country and the United States. They want someone who is open to the to, who can who, who they know will be open to the experience wanting to learn from them wanting to teach them about your ways and yeah ultimately they're looking for a good uh a good person to uh, to match that goal and if you start applying and if you get an interview my number one tip would be to read everything you can about fulbright himself the one who founded it uh, because they love the story because it's all about connecting the world and making us um understand each other so that's that's the main goal but if obviously they obviously they love high grades and publishing papers they think that is great of course but for the for the human part of it they're looking for a good candidate to represent the country and uh, get a better connection between the countries Okay, so you mentioned a few things over here. You've mentioned the personal statement and the interview. Uh, can you tell us about the different components of the application process? Uh, for instance, the letters of recommendation that they require and anything else that may be needed for the application? Yeah, they they ask for a personal statement, which is yeah. one paper, and then they ask for your study objective or research project. So I made sure to keep that separate my personal statement was basically the same for Columbia and for Fulbright, but of course I changed a few things for each institution. Uh, but the same goes there. They also want a good story. That okay. it's the they really want a good story and be very and be clear about your goal. Like know what you're gonna do. Don't don't write the when you're doing the study objective. Not you don't want to just. Oh, I just want to try something new. Um, I'm just going to go there and see what happens. Like, even though you don't have it, have like a clear vision of what you will accomplish from from doing that school program through through Fulbright, and tell them that uh, you would be very proud to be a Fulbright representative. Uh, and apart from the personal statement, uh, they also require some. They they also have an interview process. Yeah. All right. All right, great. Uh, so the final question that I have for you on this is whether internships can be used to demonstrate work experience for the purpose of your application for the Fulbright scholarship. Yes, for sure. They want to know everything. It's a very tedious and long lasting pro pro process to apply for the Fulbright scholarship and they want to know everything and they take everything into account. 
and all I had I've done a lot of volunteer work for example in my uh, in my days and I think that all, if you're like if you show a willingness to help society to give back in any way that is always looked very well well upon so they will they will ask you about everything so so tell them everything you've done perfect thank you for that so that brings me to the end of my questions uh, mm -hmm. we leave the floor open for a few minutes and if anyone in the audience has any questions please go right ahead and ask uh, you can unmute yourself or you can just use the chat box whatever works Come on, people. <laughs> Still waiting. OK, yeah, someone's typing something in the chat. OK, Bharti, yeah, you can go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Uh, Ma'am, I do know that for getting a job in US, we need to study one year of LLM there, right? Sorry, what, what did you say in the beginning? That to get a job in US, we need to do. We need to study one year of LLM of their country there in the in their university. Yeah. So to be able to sit for the bar, you need to have an LLM from a US uh, university, an okay. ABA accredited university, and okay. it's it's New York and California that allow uh, non-American JDs to take the bar. And unless you did uh, your whole uh, law school in English and in common law, you have to do one year of LLM before you can uh, be eligible for the bar. Then you have this OPT year after the after your LLM. You can work for one year without trouble in the United States, but after that, uh, there are a lot of these uh, complications. OK, so it's better recommended to do one year of LLM there. I mean, if uh, if are you f to be able to work in the US as a lawyer, you mean? Yes. Yeah, I would say it's pretty hard to get a job here without an American LLM and out without taking the bar either in New York or California, unless you're already working at an American based firm in your respective country and they have a position and they want to transfer their associates between countries for some reason. But I feel like the most most of the people that I know here who already have jobs in my LLM, they were working for this firm in their country and are coming now to the United States doing the LLM and taking the bar and then are allowed to transfer to the New York office. OK, thank you. Uh, Ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, thank yeah. you. So I wanted to ask if someone doesn't have the, I mean, the requirements, if the person doesn't have the work experience and he doesn't have something published in the in any journal. So should that person basically apply for the scholarship or I mean, sh should apply for the this Columbia uh, Law School or should he wait and gain experience for two years and then apply. Uh, I remember this was asked a lot when I were when I was in the application process and I did like a web webinar with the, the graduate office people at Columbia and they said that usually they do prefer you to have uh, two years of work experience not just for them, but also for the student, because they're going to benefit more from from the program af after they've worked a little bit. And they, and but but what they also said is, if you want to come now, send us the application. And if you and, and we might we might they might write back. You have great uh, potential, and we would love to see you. Like if you if you work for a year and apply next year, we will for sure want to see you again. Like. Oh, apply if it if it makes sense for your life plan right now to go to school next year or whenever. Oh, just apply. It, the worst thing that could happen is that they they will decline. But but and and they do and they they said that they do sometimes tell people like we can't accept you now, but this looks great. Work for some time. Come back. We would love to have you. So, but it but like I said, there are a few students here who are coming straight out of law school, but most of us have worked. For for 
one, two, three years. OK, uh, also, ma'am, uh, I just want to make a, re a humble request, basically. If, yeah, if I mean, if you could uh, give some time for uh, giving us feedback on our personal statement, would it be, I mean, possible for you? Sorry? Uh, I wanted to ask you if someone wants some feedback in their personal statement. So would you be able to give them the feedback? Me? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I know there are services out there that you can uh, get like assistance or uh, someone to read over your personal statements, but what they also say in no, the... No, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, like general uh, like, uh, tips in the sense that if they want to connect with you later sometime. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. No, yeah, you're, you're, you're free to do that. Yeah. That's, yeah. OK, thank you. It's no problem. All right, uh, thank you for that, Gurney. We also have another question in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello, uh, I'm a fourth year law student. I'm interested in pursuing criminal law from abroad and also settle there as a criminal slash alternate dispute resolution advocate. However, I'm confused considering whether I'll get permanent residence in the US or not. Considering this, please guide me regarding this. OK, so uh, if you get into a school, you uh, you'll get the F1 visa or the, and if you go through Fulbright, you go through with the J1 visa. And let's say you get into the school and you get a year, the OPT year, you get a job after your law school after your LLM in the United States, then you are allowed to work for that one year. But as I understand it, you're not guaranteed uh, a, a working visa after that, even though you have a employee sponsor behind you. It, there, what happens after the one year is some some kind of visa lottery. I don't know exactly how it works, but the Americans love lotteries. Everything is about lotteries. I, I don't know why, but so it is quite tricky. You, it's not guaranteed that you will get a working visa, even though you have an employer behind you. But of course, that's going to increase your chances. And I mean, there there are a lot of people who have come here for their LLM, did the OPT, and it just worked out. They ended up be, being able to stay. But there are there are a lot of hurdle, hurdles to get the permanent uh, working visa. But it's possible. Great. I hope that answers your question, Dhruv. Uh, I don't think there's anything else in the chat. Um, we don't have any hands raised either. I guess that brings us to the end of the session. Oh, OK, wait. Someone else is typing as well. I'm so sorry. OK, okay no. Yeah. yeah, that's Dhruv saying thank you for your answer. All right, so I think, yeah. This brings us to the OK. <laughs> Bharti has another question. I'm so sorry, Kudni. <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah, please. Uh, Ma'am, uh, after doing the LLM of one year from Colombia, is it really worthy? And do we have a permanent guarantee that we can work for a very long time in uh, America in a job? No, that's what that's what I was saying. It's not guaranteed. You if you if you if you're hired, you you can work for the one year after the LLM. Uh, but after that one year, it, there are going to be complications. I know of people who have gotten through that and they were able to stay with their respective employee. But you need an employee who's willing to sponsor you through that uh, process. To be able to stay for more than the one additional year after the LLM. OK, so there's no like job perspective after the LLM there. Yeah, there, there is. That's uh, there. Uh, if you get a job in the United States, you you are you can do that without problem for a year. But after that one year, that's called like optional training year or something, then you will have to apply for a, a more permanent working visa. And if you have an employer behind you, that would that would increase your chances of being able to get it for sure. Um, Goodie, as yeah. I understand, 
Bharti is also asking about the job prospects that are available to students after graduating. Oh, just in general. Yeah. Um, like I said, I know I have a friend who did his LLM in Duke in corporate law, and he's now working at Fried Frank in the New York City office. I there I, I haven't started the job application process, um, but I I know that especially in corporate law right now, there's a lot of demand after for junior associates. So I'm told that the market is very lucrative, lucrative, at least right now, but it always depends on what is happening in the world at every given time. Like I was supposed to go to Los to Colombia last fall. And at that time, the job perspectives were amazing. And then came COVID and nobody was getting a job. Now the, the economy is rising again, so it's looking good, but it's really hard to say beforehand what the job opportunities are. But I would think that in corporate law, are, there would be a lot of opportunities for sure. But, but, but Colombia is also very big with human rights and uh, public international law. And there are, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities, both for jobs after the LLM and like externships throughout the program. But not everyone gets a job in the States after their LLM. That's a fact. But 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 you but there are so many other opportunities. A lot of people go to London. A lot of people go to Brussels. For example, the international firms come to Colombia Well, come to Colum to New York to meet with Columbia students and I think it's Columbia, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, something like that. And they L L US LLM candidates are very popular, for example, to, to go back to Europe for these American firms. They appreciate that a lot. So yeah, so it's hard to say. It depends on the economy and connections and luck, and there's a lot that goes into it. Perfect. Uh, thank you for that, Marty. Sorry, <laughs> good name. <laughs> got confused between the names. Um, yeah, so there's nothing else. I think that yeah, we can wrap up the session now. Goodney, thank you so much for taking our time for this. The answers were super helpful. Yeah, and, no worries. And we'll also put up the session on college's website later on. Perfect. Sounds great. All right, thank you so much, and thank you so much, guys, for attending. Good night. Bye bye. It's lovely meeting you all. Thank you, guys. Good night. Good night. Bye.